welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 78, bringing on an author and talking with them in detail about one, occasionally more, of their books. I'm Charlie Place, and today I am joined by Eleanor Shearer. We'll be talking today about her wonderful debut, River Sing Me Home, which is set in the time after slavery had been abolished, but not really, because the plantation owners can keep the workers for six more years while pocketing the pay themselves. However, we follow Rachel, who decides to run away and look for the five hopefully still living children that slavery took from her. We're going to start getting into the details once I welcome our author. Hello, Eleanor. Hi, nice to see you. It's really good to have you on. So let's cover these apprenticeships I've mentioned. You've said before, I believe, that we don't know much about it in the UK. And I know definitely I did a university module on slavery. It was great, but I had no idea about it either. Can you tell us about them? Yes. So in 1834, which is when uh, River Sing Me Home opens, slavery has been abolished in the British Empire. But the law states that rather than being slaves, people on plantations are now apprentices. And what that means is they have to keep working for their former masters without pay for another six years. And it comes from this very racist, paternalistic idea that enslaved people weren't ready for freedom. They needed this transitional period to kind of prepare them for the responsibility. And one thing I think it's important to clarify, because I've had people ask me sometimes, was this a case of there's a distance between the legislature in the UK and people in the Caribbean on the ground able to kind of circumvent or bypass the law. It was in the law itself. So it was always intended by the British government that this would be the case. It's not plantation owners resisting the abolition of slavery. It's actually the way that they conceived of abolition was this very gradual process. And because the novel is about what it means to be free, I always knew I wanted to set it in this very ambiguous time when by law, the term for the kind of labour you're doing has changed, but the labour that you're doing has not. Goodness. So it was in law. I guess it was to appease the plantation owners as well. Yes, another thing that uh, some people do know, probably a little bit better known than the apprenticeships, but not that widely appreciated, was the fact that plantation owners got compensation after slavery was abolished and not enslaved people because it was a sense that they'd lost property. And in fact, for those who think slavery and all of this history is in the distant past, I think it was only in 2015 that the British government paid off the debt that they incurred to give that compensation to slave owners. So all of this is still, I think, very recent and very integrated into the fabric of Britain and our politics and our wealth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, that's not far away at all. And I've got a question that I think we'll link up with that in a minute. But can you talk about your very initial inspiration? I know you went to an exhibition, uh, I believe when you were 16. Can you tell us about it? Yes. So my background is my grandparents are part of the Windrush generation. So I've always been interested in Caribbean history. They came from St. Lucia and from Barbados. And when I was 16, I went with my mum to this exhibition called Making Freedom, put on by the Windrush Foundation. And the idea of the exhibition was that in the UK, we tell this story about abolition that's very triumphalist, that really centres white people like William Wilberforce. And that doesn't do any justice to the agency of enslaved people. The fact that freedom wasn't just something that was given to people in the Caribbean, it was won through struggle and through resistance. So this exhibition was all about those various forms of resistance. And they range from small everyday acts like refusing labor or running away through to big rebellions and revolutions like the Haitian Revolution. As part of this exhibition, they just had this small panel that said, we know after emancipation that women often went looking to try and find the children that have been taken away from them and sold to different plantations and different islands. And one of the great crimes of slavery was the way it was working to destroy people's family lives, whether that was taking children away, but also the act of renaming people when they were brought over from Africa, denying that connection with your ancestors as well. And so because that was so central to what slavery was, I just thought this was such a poignant act of resistance to kind of put the fragments of a family back together again and refuse to let it stay destroyed after slavery had ended. So from that moment on, I always knew that I wanted to one day write a novel about these women and inspired by their bravery and use it as a way to delve into larger questions of the legacy of slavery and the way that people made freedom for themselves after it was over. But before that came your MA, can you tell us about that? Yes. So as I say, because of my mixed race heritage, I was always interested in Caribbean history. And I did a master's looking at the legacy of slavery and the case for reparations. It was in in politics. 
but as part of that I did some field work so I went out to St Lucia and Barbados which is where I've got family and I spoke to family members I spoke to reparations activists I spoke to historians and the idea was to try and understand how is slavery remembered on the islands and what does that mean for the case for reparations and what really struck me was first of all the way that people were really quick to talk about resistance as opposed to other elements of, you know, suffering or exploitation. One of my mother's cousins was talking about how his family live on lands that was used by runaway slaves, and that was a real point of pride. But also people talked about how the echoes of things done in slavery still continue to be felt today. So in particular, this issue of family, which strengthened my resolve to write this book about women looking for their children, because right up to this day, you have fragmented families in the Caribbean, you have wave after wave of often economically driven migration, whether it's people going to build the Panama Canal, whether it's people moving to America or to the UK as part of the Windrush generation. And in my own family, we've experienced that fragmentation firsthand. We had my grandfather leaving his family in Barbados. He moved to St. Lucia, where he met my grandmother. But he never really was in touch with his family in Barbados again. But recently, in fact, as part of that fieldwork for my master's, I was able to reach out to his one surviving sister who turned 90 last year and was able to be back in touch with her and sort of repair that family link. And so this issue of fractured families but the possibility of reconnection was very live in my mind after I finished my master's and really lent itself to then tackling the challenge of of writing the novel. Mm -hmm. Well it's nice to hear about your family and I believe you said that the psychological reparations are more important than economic. I think not more important but what I was interested in was that there are a subset of people who are left-wing and generally progressive who consider themselves to be egalitarian. So they would say, I wish that the world's economic resources were more fairly distributed. And if that was the case, there would be no further need for reparations. So I think for as long as economic inequality exists on the scale that it does, both within countries and between countries, I absolutely think economic reparations should be on the table as part of correcting that. But I was more addressing the people who say, well, if we just distributed all of the world's resources fairly, what then? Why would we still need reparations? And I think that's when you need to look at the psychic dimension, where you need to look at the harms that weren't material and say, well, there are going to still need to be things done, still healing and repair done to fix those non-material harms. So it was more explaining why there's a distinctive need for reparations over and above just generally being an egalitarian and wanting things to be more equal. Can I ask, obviously, you've got a background in this, you've studied this, you know this, what to your mind would be good reparations to make? I think the first thing is about what I would call closing the memory gap. So I have always been struck by the way that in the UK, slavery is remembered, the history of the Caribbean is remembered, or more accurately, not remembered. One of the things my grandparents found so jarring about coming to this country is they were raised in a time when St. Lucia was still part of the British Empire. They sang the national anthem. They thought of themselves as more English than the English. My mum is named after two English monarchs. And when they came to this country, people had either never heard of the Caribbean or if they had, they only knew Jamaica and nothing else. And that almost disrespect of your whole life being shaped by a country that cares so little about you. I think that is part of the trauma of what's been done to the Caribbean and just some kind of recognition, acknowledgement and building that knowledge within Britain of what has happened. But also, to be honest, within the Caribbean, one of the things that I was surprised by when I went there was that although there were some pockets of oral history and passing down of what's happened, in a lot of places you found silence because of the pain. And so I I think as a result of that, I'd gone in expecting a lot of the dialogue around reparations, a lot of what the activists were doing to be about dialogue with the UK, you know, getting money from the UK, getting apologies from the UK. A lot of these activists are already doing the work on the ground within their communities because reparations is literally about repairing the past. And a lot of that repair can come from within. It can come from reconnecting with their history in a way that makes people feel proud of what happened, reconnecting with unlearning internalised racism, internalised white beauty standards, all these things were imported to the region. And so I think that there's a role there for Britain to play in terms of supporting and financially particularly supporting those kind of community efforts as well. So it's not just all about us and all about what we can do. It's also about how can we support the Caribbean to be 
doing that work within their communities because particularly I feel for the younger generation I was speaking to there was a sense of we're independent nations now we want to stand on our own two feet we don't want to be locked in this interminable battle negotiating our past with Britain but the reality is that there's still so much work to do it all comes back to this issue of respecting agency. That's what I always think. It's about respecting agency in the past by centering the stories of Caribbean people. And it's about respecting agency in the present by giving people the resources they need to be able to do the work to develop, you know, vibrant, resilient communities. So yeah, I think those are the things that I would focus on. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, we need a good connection that works for the Caribbean countries and islands. Yes. Okay, so we've covered your MA, we've covered the exhibition. I would like to ask about Rachel in herself as a character. Could you talk about the inspirations for her? I know you've got inspirations from family, you've got factual historical inspirations, that kind of thing. Yes, so the historical inspiration for Rachel is that, as I mentioned, I went to this exhibition and then a little while later I was lucky enough to meet the man who was critical to putting it on, who's called Arthur Torrington, who runs the Windrush Foundation. And I met him for a different reason. At the end I said, I just have to say, you know, it's been three or four years now, I'm still thinking about that exhibition and the fact that there were these women who went looking for their children. He said, oh yes, I can give you a copy of the book that we drew that from and it's this oral history the transcribed life story of a man called Samuel Smith, who was born in Antigua in the 1870s. And he remembers his great, great grandmother, who was called Mother Rachel, who walked from the south of Antigua to the north after abolition to find her daughter, Minty. And so Rachel, obviously shares a name with Mother Rachel and was drawing on that real life example of someone trying to find their children and being successful in finding their children. But then to kind of flesh Rachel out and get into the head of someone who in lots of ways is so different from me. You know, I'm a lot younger than Rachel. I don't have children. I'm mixed race. I'm not black as she is. I'm obviously not enslaved. But I was thinking about these black women in my life, particularly my mother, my step grandmother, my aunt and my grandmother and how they have adapted to and been changed by the experiences that they've had. In particular, it's made them quite quiet and quite cautious people, especially when out in in the world, because that's the way you have to adapt when the world has treated you badly. You have to be on the lookout for harm and on the lookout for people that want to hurt you. But at the same time, they've retained so much love and hope and optimism. And I wanted Rachel to be a character that combines those elements and has those multitudes within her and all those different emotions. And so it was drawing out that sense of here is someone who obviously has been changed by the trauma that she's been through. It's impossible for her not to be. I was cognizant of the fact that there are so many stereotypes around the betrayal of black women and particularly the idea that they are always you know strong and resilient and Rachel is a strong and resilient character but she's so much more than that and so finding moments in the novel where she can feel doubt where she can feel hopeless but then also where she can pick herself back up again and find joy and find light and find reasons to hope again so yeah those are the two sources for Rachel that historical angle and then to flesh around and get inside her head I was thinking about a little closer to home people in my own family. She is a very complex character in the ways that you stated. Did Mother Rachel find Minty, do we know? She did find Minty, yes. Yes, it was a, I think the ways in which people find their lost relations are so interesting to me. So in Minty's case, it was partly that she was branded. She had a particular brand on her shoulder. So even though it had been many, many years, they were able to ask around if anyone had seen someone with this brand. And then that's one of the ways they were able to recognise her. In the novel, also, there's this issue of faces and seeing things in people's faces that I've sometimes had people who aren't from the Caribbean ask me, is that plausible that someone would see Rachel's face in the novel and say, I recognise that, I'm sure I've met your daughter. But it's something that's happened to me in the Caribbean before I've been in St Lucia and met someone who looked at my face and said, I think I work with your cousin. And then it turned out we were actually related and our branches of the family had lost touch and didn't know about each other. But that constantly being attuned to people's faces because there is all this separation and this chance that you will have long lost family that you've never met. But in that particular instance as well, when it happened to me, it was very affirming because I am, I pass for white. And so I feel like particularly in the UK, people don't do the work of looking past skin colour and seeing how my features are arranged. Whereas in the Caribbean, which is a very multicultural place, this guy took it for granted that I might be from the region and could see how my face looks very similar to the face of his colleague, even though his colleague is much darker skinned than I am. So yeah, there are all these different ways that people had to try and find family that was lost to them and that people continue to use to this day to find family that's lost to them, whether it's about appearance and 
tracing names you often bump into people and you realize that they're from the Caribbean there's so few surnames in a place like St Lucia that you think oh my goodness we must be related because you're a Joseph and my great-great-grandmother was a Joseph and so yeah it's it's funny (laughs) I I like family history it's different obviously but I like family history so those those stories are lovely you say you met your cousin then through this this person who introduced you to each other have your family then been able to meet that branch of the family and continue connecting Yes. So we, um, that was when, when I went out to do my field work. So he was the grandson of my grandmother's half brother. And so we then were in touch with his father, my mother's I guess, half cousin, and went to visit them in St. Lucia, which was lovely. And um, he was actually the cousin who lived on the land that was used by runaway slaves. So that was the kind of historical thing that he was able to teach me as well. So yeah, it was lovely. Again, moments of reconnection are always possible however distant they may seem wonderful that's lovely so on children kind of going on from from this can i ask in the book itself in your book was the order in which rachel finds her children important it was so obviously she's looking for five children when i started out i had my outline i guess pretty bare bones but i knew this is the order she's going to find them and this is what's happened to them And I think it's that there's a kind of mirror in the fates of the children. So you've got two children who obviously end up with Rachel at the end, her two daughters. You've got two children who in different ways are alive but can't be part of her journey. So you've got Thomas Augustus, who's in the runaway village and doesn't want to leave in Guyana. And you've got Cherry Jane, who's passing as a free mixed race woman, so doesn't can't continue any contact with her mother. And then you've got Micah, who is the child who's dead. And so I think I knew that I wanted the shape of the story to be first and last child, the ones that stay with her, the second child to be the one who's died, because I think after the rush of euphoria at the first connection, even though Thomas Augustus and Cherry Jane aren't necessarily easy reunions, they're still reunions. And so I think I knew that you had to throw in a kind of cast doubt on the idea that others of the children would be alive or able to be found so I knew that second of all she would have to find out about Micah and then Thomas Augustus and Cherry Jane the order of that was determined by where I knew I wanted them to be so I knew that there were some free and maroon communities in Trinidad but by far the most populous runaway villages would have been in Guyana where you had these great rainforests that weren't yet touched by British colonialism as much so it made sense for Thomas Augustus to be there and then Cherry Jane to be on the final leg in Trinidad. So yeah, that was why each of the children fell where they did in Rachel's journey. Yeah, no, fascinating. When I started the book, I thought, okay, so she's going to find these children. And I thought, okay, we're either going to have a sad story first, or yeah, we're going to have a a happier story. And once I got past that first happy story, I thought, okay, the rest is not going to be easy. (laughs) Um, But no, I I loved how you did it. And yeah, you say it was important. You ordered it in that way. And yeah, you can kind of sense that. I want to ask about another character, Nobody, Mm -hmm. which is, I know, I think you said it's a real name, but Mm -hmm. it was also, you just worked it really well in the text as the kind of literary features it gave you as well. Can you tell us about how you came to use the name, if there were any real records of real nobodies that you could find, etc.? Yes, so a lot of the names in the novel are names taken from real documents. In particular, there's a memorial in the University of the West Indies in Barbados that lists a selection of names of enslaved people that were listed on plantations at the time of emancipation. So I'm pretty sure that certainly Cherry Jane and Thomas Augustus and Mary Grace and Mercy, I think, are all names taken from that memorial. And then a lot of the other minor characters, I was using the slave registers, which actually feature in the book as a plot point, but they were these real documents that, after the abolition of slavery, were accounting for the movement of enslaved people, in theory, to try and prevent too much of the kind of illegal trade continuing and people bringing uh, enslaved people to the islands. And so they were just quite an evocative way to go through. And I almost thought of it as an act of witnessing. You have these huge reams of names and these are people who would have left so little trace otherwise. And for each of them, there's a whole life behind it. And it was looking through those that I found the name Nobody in one of the Barbados slave registers. So I don't know anything about this person beyond their name, but I just thought, what an evocative name. I really want to use it. And then Nobody is a fascinating character to me because I initially did not intend for him to play as big a role in the novel as he ended up. So as I said, when I started out, my outline was 
these are Rachel's five children. And at the end, we will have Rachel and her two daughters and her daughter's uh, baby. That'll be the kind of ending image of them as a kind of newly reconstituted family. And nobody was always meant to function more like some of the other minor characters in the novel, like Mama B or the Armstrongs, where he's there for a small part of it, a couple of chapters, gives them some help and then recedes into the background as they continue on. And it was only as I was writing him that I thought, number one, I really enjoy writing this character, you know, with this backstory of having been a sailor and been at sea and having made all these difficult choices about his own freedom, you know, running away when he was so young. And then the fact that he's been on voyages that would have been slave voyages and part of the backbone of empire, you know, it's almost an image of freedom as a kind of collusion, but it's enabled him to carve out this life for himself. And then also I was intrigued by the idea of this romance with Mary Grace and the fact that you could give her more of a, a story and more of a growth herself by keeping him in the journey. And finally, the novel is very much about motherhood and it's very much about Rachel's connection with her children. And it's a deliberate choice that the fathers of the children don't feature in the novel. But I wanted there to be a sense of male energy at the end. I realised it made sense rather than just having this incredibly female set of characters, Rachel and her daughters. And actually in my head initially, Mercy's child was a, a girl as well. I switched it up slightly by having nobody there. So you get this sense of a kind of new family forming because he and Mary Grace have married each other. But then you also have Mercy's son rather than daughter. So again, there's a kind of new generation but it just felt like slightly more balanced to keep him involved and as I say I really enjoyed writing him so I'm glad that I kept him around. Yeah yeah no it's, it is a lovely family unit. You have said there about the lack of information about the fathers of Rachel's children and that's actually something I thought of asking you and I thought oh, no, maybe we'll leave it but actually you have noted it so I mean what was behind your decision to leave those out I suppose leave the information out yes I think that a lot of it stemmed from the fact that because there was going to be always going to be a mixed race character Cherry Jane and because realistically the only way that Cherry Jane could be mixed race was through a really awful union through rape a big theme of the novel is is what can and cannot be said and many of the characters don't speak their traumas out loud they don't need to and so I always knew I wouldn't want a scene where Rachel reflects at length on or tells someone about the fact that she's been raped. That's always just going to be an absence in the book. And so sort of spinning out from that, I was thinking, well, if that father is not in the picture, then what would it mean to also remove the others and have them as these absences? And I think there are hints in the text of what has happened and not all of them are as horrific or tragic as that, but there is a, a sadness to each of the experiences. So in my mind, there's a point where Rachel says to nobody that she's known other people who are wanderers and she's known them to leave. So in my mind, one of the fathers was a free man who was in the vicinity for a while. They had a couple of children together and then he left. And so there's a, a pain of parting there. And then finally, when Mercy is pregnant at the end, Rachel talks about the pain of carrying a child, wondering if it will come out looking not like someone you hate, as in Cherry Jane's instance, but like someone that you love, but is now gone. So I think Rachel had another man who was the love of her life who died. And so this sense that, yes, because trauma can't always be spoken and because painful past experiences can't always be lingered on, the fathers are there as a kind of absence in the text and you can try and find the clues about who they are, but they don't feature as directly. And I think also by removing them, you really enable and intensify the focus on the relationship between Rachel and her children. So that was kind of what was going through my mind when I decided that I wasn't going to go into a huge amount of detail about who the fathers were. Oh, and I think that fact actually brings more poignancy to what happens with Mercy and her husband, I think. A theme that didn't occur to me so much, probably, frankly, because I, I just don't have children myself, so it may not be on my radar. Talking about motherhood was important, was it? Yes. As I say, the origin of this story was motherhood. The origin of this story was hearing about mothers who went looking for their children after they had been taken away from them. And I think it was important because there was such a history of denying black motherhood. The, the real cruelty of of it, especially in this period after the abolition of the slave trade, when planters did need more labour, was that women like Rachel would have been valued in the sense that they were mothers, that they could produce children, but not in the full emotional sense that they were mothers. There was no sense that they would form a natural attachment. And 
there's obviously wonderful novels about black motherhood in other contexts that I was drawing inspiration from. Toni Morrison's Beloved in particular is such a fascinating and very dark portrait of the difficult choices that you have to make as a mother in the context of slavery and the choice of women like Cynthia and that novel to kill their children rather than let them be enslaved, you know, the prevalence of abortions or infanticide on plantations. That often led to this perception from white people that there was no no real love there. You know, they didn't feel natural familial love like white people did. And that was just a complete failure to understand the context in which people were operating. So there's just so much history behind this idea of motherhood and the reason that it's so important. And it's something that in my own family, we've talked a lot about actually, because I think that it's changing now, but there was a very strong white feminist streak for a very long time that basically saw motherhood as something that was never valuable. And to be as sympathetic as possible to that frame of mind, I think when you've only ever seen motherhood as this very confining thing that would limit your autonomy, I can understand why you would want to react against it, but it failed to take account of different contexts. It failed to take account of the fact that, you know, my mum has always said that as a black woman herself, she thinks of being a good mother and keeping a, a stable family together as one of the great achievements of her life. And it was the same for her mother as an immigrant woman, able to still provide love and care for the family in England after everything that they've been through. And so wanting to celebrate motherhood almost in response to this sense that sometimes it's not something that women should be talking about or celebrating it's difficult to do so in a way that that respects all choices. And um, I think the novel is not just about biological motherhood. It's also about other forms of care and community more widely. And it was important to me that it wasn't just saying that, you know, the form of love that Rachel has for her children is the only valid form of love. But there was this core of wanting to explore this issue of, of black motherhood and the history of it within the context of enslavement. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you, you also do it with Mrs. Armstrong as well. That's part of her story. You've mentioned like the storytelling and stuff. I'm about to get onto that, but I will ask one question first that will lead us into it. The language and dialogue. I believe you said that you wanted to write with Creole languages, but still have it accessible to non-Caribbean readers. So I wanted to ask how you went about doing this, that sort of thing. Yeah, it was an evolving process. And actually, my mum was a huge assistance in this because I feel like So my grandmother passed away before I was born, but my grandfather and my step-grandmother, I can sort of hear their voices in my head, but I'm not obviously a a native speaker of any Caribbean languages. And my mum is much more directly tied into that linguistic aspect of the region. And so in the first draft of the book, the characters all spoke basically like I do. And my mum just said, this is not realistic. It's taken me out of the story because this is not how they would have spoken at the time. And it also has a flattening effect because everyone's dialogue comes across as the same. So it was working with my mum and thinking, okay, well, what are some of the features of Caribbean languages? So the sort of use of different pronouns, me for I, in lots of instances, but also one of the things I love is the um, differences in verb conjugation and the use of tenses. So in particular, you have that chapter in the middle, which is Orion, who was a kind of a mentor figure to Micah when he was still alive in Guyana. Orion is telling Rachel about what happened to Micah and it's obviously a story that takes place in the past but because of the way that Caribbean verb endings work all the verbs have a kind of present tense effect and so it feels I think a lot more immediate as a form of storytelling. So those are the kind of small tweaks that we ended up with where you're giving just enough to make it sound like a Creole language but as I say not so much and not so much instances of slang that people wouldn't know that's prevalent in the region so yeah it was a bit of a a balancing act and I'm sure it's it's far from perfect or historically accurate but I just wanted to get enough of a sense there to make people feel like they were part of the world and part of the history. You've got obviously the language that you're talking about you've got Cherry Jane's obviously different language and then you've got the complete lack of language for Mary Grace which I really found very interesting. You have got her muteness can you tell us how this contributes to the novel as a whole and whether it's to do with storytelling, etc. if that makes sense. Yes, I think it's more about trauma than it is about storytelling. So one of the things that came up in my master's, which was a concept that I think is wonderful, is this idea of post-memory. So it comes from a Jewish-American theorist called Marianne Hirsch. And she uses it in the context of her parents were 
born in what's now Ukraine and then fled during the Second World War. And she has never been back to their place of birth until she goes on a trip with them when they're fairly elderly. And she's walking around this city and feeling like she remembers the place. Her sense of it is so vivid, even though she's never been there before. And she says that this is a result of hearing stories passed down by them about what their lives were like growing up in this place, but also the fact that she's had to fill in so many gaps with her own imagination because there are things that they can't say and there are silences around those stories. So it's that unique combination of a story and silence that produces this post-memory, this really vivid sense that you know something, you understand the place or understand an experience, even if you haven't been there. And the sort of irony was that as I was doing this fieldwork in the Caribbean I was on that kind of journey myself looking for post-memory in the sense of people in the region having a close identification with the past of colonialism and slavery and then I was myself experiencing a kind of post-memory just from the islands themselves and the fact that these are places that my grandparents left that I grew up wondering about what it must have been like for them to come to the UK, what it must have been like for them. They weren't always very forthcoming about their pasts in the islands. And so I have all this emotion to work through when I visit the Caribbean as well. And all of that is to say that I was bringing to the novel this sense of when something like slavery occurs, not everything can be said aloud. And so Mary Grace is the extreme version of that. She's been through something so traumatic that she can no longer speak anything, not just about the trauma, but in general, has lost the power of speech. But all of the characters sit somewhere on that spectrum of being unable to talk directly about what's happened to them. And it's why characters with common histories can feel so bound together even without needing to speak. You know, I think one of the relationships I really enjoyed writing was between Mrs. Armstrong, the seamstress in Bridgetown, and Rachel, because they are superficially very different. You know, Mrs. Armstrong is now free. She's part of the free black middle class in Bridgetown. She's fair skinned, but actually she was born enslaved like Rachel. And there is a set of experiences and stories that they both know that they can share when they feel able to and then not share when it gets too painful but they know that the other will understand even if they don't have to fully get down into unpacking the pain so yes that's where this idea of speaking and not speaking came from is is how do we respond to trauma and how does that shape what we can and can't say it was interesting when you decided to where i suppose i should say where you decided to have her speak again mary grace where she'd reached a certain level of freedom, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And she felt happier and obviously still lots of trauma, but she felt she could speak. Furthering on this end, the storytelling, you've got the stories that the characters tell to each other about their past, as you have talked about already. Was including this oral history, was this important? Yes, it was absolutely crucial. I knew partly because of this experience I'd had of doing field work and talking to people and gathering stories that I wanted the book to have an oral history quality to it. And also I wanted it to have this sense that, you know, the book is in many ways a really intense focus on on Rachel, you know, close to third person. You never deviate really from her point of view. But I wanted this sense that it's almost like icebergs. Every character that she interacts with, even if it's only for a sentence or two, you know that there's a full and rich life behind that character, as full and rich as Rachel's. And it's this sense that these are people that in Britain, in British mainstream history, we don't hear their stories. We haven't heard their stories yet and giving them space on the page to tell them and making sure I incorporated a broad spectrum, like I say, Many people wouldn't have been aware of the fact that there were free black people living in in Bridgetown and what would their lives have been like as the Armstrongs were. The indigenous people of the Caribbean aren't always as well known as they should be. And so having an indigenous character there as well to talk about the commonalities and differences between that experience of British colonialism as compared to Rachel's. Yeah, I just wanted to really suffuse the novel with this sense that everyone in the region is living these incredibly complex lives that we can only know the very tip of the iceberg and Yeah, it was also enjoyable as a writer to have these moments of coming up with a character, coming up with their backstory, even if you then whittle it down to only one or two sentences on the page. There are a lot of characters in the novel where they don't appear for very long, but I've got, (laughs) there's one in particular, the donkey man, the man who they meet on the road in Trinidad, who's got a donkey with cop hands. And in the final draft, he doesn't even have a name, but in an earlier draft, he had three and a half thousand words of sit down, let me tell you my life story. So He's a man that I know a lot about, even if it didn't make it into the book itself. But in the end, it seemed more potent to have him as someone who 
kind of walks away and they think what an incongruous set of of things you know his appearance the objects he's carrying how could he possibly have ended up here but that's the beauty of it it's the beauty of freedom and agency in a world after slavery that suddenly unexpected paths were opening up for people and you never quite know how your life is going to turn out no, that's interesting because as he uh, appears and he's journeying towards them, I thought this guy's going to have a lot to tell. So that, that's interesting that you did have it originally and it's been cut out. It's, it still shows that there's something there. Going to go on a different topic. You have essentially the question of what freedom is exactly. Like, is it searching for children, staying as a runaway in the forest, both of those things and more. It was important to you to discuss these versions of freedom. Yes, and I always knew that Rachel's five children would in different ways represent what it means to be free. So you you have other ways in which freedom enters into the novel. We talked earlier about the question of this ambiguity of emancipation and the fact that you were free in name only, but still tied to the land itself. You have that question of freedom as, as knowledge, as searching for your children. And then for each of Rachel's children, there's uh, other versions of freedom explored. So um, you mentioned the runaways, setting up a contrast between the life of a runaway, which I think of as a often a more individualized form of freedom. It's removing yourself from the plantation, but knowing that the system will continue without you versus what Micah went through, which is taking part in the very real rebellion of 1823 in Demerara, which is a very collective image of freedom. It's I will not be free until the plantation system is ended, until everyone is, is free. And then, of course, you have Cherry Jane as well. One of the, for me, as someone who is mixed race, but chooses to embrace my heritage, the very difficult to write experience of freedom as passing, as denying your true heritage in order to access a more privileged space. And in many ways, that's the antithesis of Rachel's journey, where her freedom is reconnecting with her family. Cherry Jane's freedom is severing ties with her family. So you have these kind of mirrors of freedom, I think, through the novel, different people making different choices. But what I wanted to show with each story is that none of the choices come without costs. So Micah, I think, has in many ways the most expansive and romantic ideal of freedom, but dies for it. Thomas Augustus might be living what we think of as a more constrained life, but ultimately he is alive and he's able to flourish in the forest with his community. But his choice has come with its own costs as well. Cherry Jane's is a choice where the costs are incredibly obvious. And I think for a modern reader, it's very hard for us to imagine what it would have been like for the benefits to outweigh those costs, but in a world that was so exploitative, so horrendously racist, there were huge benefits to be gained by doing what Cherry Jane was doing. So I wanted to reflect without judgment that that is a choice that someone would be able to make. And so what does it mean to be free in a world of such constraint? You know, I have said before that this was a book about recognising the agency of Caribbean people but also recognising that agency isn't exercised in a vacuum, it's exercised in this historical time and place where there were so many limits on what black people could do. And how do you deal with those constraints? How are you still exercising choice even within those constraints? It's interesting what you say about Cherry Jane as well. It's difficult to look at it in hindsight, but I think you say a lot just by how little she is in the novel as herself. Mm. It's, it does say a lot. There seems to be a theme of water in your book. The sea, but more water on its own, because also you've got the rivers, you've got everything. Can you talk about this? Yes. I am, as a person, enamoured with water. I love the sea. I love rivers. My parents now live in Ramsgate in the UK, so I love to go see them and be on the coast. I used to do a lot of rowing, so I was always on the river every day. So I think there's a kind of personal aspect of being enamoured with and fascinated by water. But also, I always knew... I wanted the novel to be really rooted in the geography of the Caribbean. And what was in my mind was the fact that I've already mentioned, I think there's such a lack of stories about slavery in the Caribbean. And where we do get stories about slavery in the UK or in the US, they're almost always about the American South. And the geography of slavery in the American South was very different. And the fact that the islands themselves can be part of your confinement, the fact that, you know, at the beginning of the novel, we meet Rachel, she's running, and then she reaches the end of the island, and there is no further that she can run. Now, running to freedom in the American South was by no means easy, but there was this long tradition of the sense of the northern route to freedom, and the idea that if you just went far enough across land, you could be free, and that gave hope to so many people. In the Caribbean, you don't have that, and so I wanted to have the sea there as this image of confinement, but also... I guess the river that later features in the novel carries Rachel to her children. So it's also a, an enabler of her freedom. And I think there's a 
passage in the novel that probably expresses this better than I can, but I'm paraphrasing that it's about the world, the natural world being neither malign nor benign. It's kind of indifferent to the, the human struggles. And so I do think being attuned to the natural world gives you a, an advantage. And so Rachel at one point reflects on the sort of arrogance of colonialism and seeing land as unclaimed and seeing it as empty there's an arrogance there because often it wasn't empty it had people in it but even where there weren't people in it there was still nature there was still animals and so Rachel is on that journey into the interior of Guyana more attuned to the natural world and that serves her I think better than someone who would have come into that world and not seen the richness of it but at the same time as I say the natural world has been part of confining Rachel to her plantation for so long so it's not like it's this purely sort of benign and magical force in the novel that only helps her on her way it can harm her as well and so yeah I wanted water and nature more generally to have that resonance in the novel because I I'm fascinated and terrified by something like the sea it's just so vast and unknown in large part to us I think that's why it holds such fascination Mm -hmm. I love novels that deal with with water as a theme with the sea as a theme but no it's it's interesting because of course you've got the heart that is water provides life and it takes it so you have mentioned the runaways and the natives who are working together and you've got this the workings the relationships between them these runaways and the native people we see Thomas Augustus he wants to stay and he does stay he doesn't leave with Rachel but the narrative basically gives us foresight on the idea that the villagers aren't going to be around for very much longer the white people are basically closing in and taking up all the land did the runaways and those communities did they have to abandon their villages in reality in reality I think it's a bit of a mix there are still communities particularly around Latin America where there was a continued mixed indigenous and runaway presence in more remote areas in the same way that across Latin America, you have indigenous peoples that were able to continue in their areas of the forest. I think those areas got smaller and smaller and it got harder and harder, but there were still some refuges. The Maroons of Jamaica are a fascinating example because they were operating slightly differently. So runaway communities were more prevalent in places where the geography supported it. So the novel opens in Barbados, a country that's very small and very flat and very densely settled at the time. So there weren't really maroon communities in Barbados. If you were a runaway, you were probably trying to get to Bridgetown and just blend in with the larger crowds and hope you wouldn't be discovered. Jamaica is an island with mountainous regions that are very inaccessible. And so there were these communities of runaway slaves that entrenched themselves there and the British ended up signing an agreement with them to respect their autonomy and freedom in exchange for collusion with the plantation system. Essentially, these were people that became patrolmen, a kind of second militia for the British, capturing runaways and returning them to their plantations. So the Maroons were able to keep their communities and there will be people in Jamaica today that will claim Maroon ancestry directly from those original communities. But that was largely because they found their niche within the plantation system. That was difficult to read that they did have to effectively work with the British. Mm. So the rising in Demerara, 1823, <laughs> which is where Micah's story is effectively from. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Yeah, so in general, I wanted to include an uprising in the novel because, as I say, it was one vision of freedom. But also, I think these are forms of rebellion that aren't particularly well known. And they play such an important role in the story of British emancipation. So... There were many, many uprisings and armed rebellions throughout history, but starting with the Haitian Revolution, which starts just after the French Revolution and then goes till 1804 when Haiti becomes the first independent black republic outside of Africa. That was an example of the slaves taking first their freedom, they forced the French into emancipating them, and then taking their independence from French colonialism by force. And that sent shockwaves through the rest of the Caribbean, and it created this constant choice afterwards of do we keep slavery or do we lose the colonies? And so initially the perception was, well, two thirds of the slaves in Haiti were born in Africa. And so there's this sense that it's to do with their innate barbarism and the slaves born in the Caribbean are much more docile. And so, of course, if we just abolish the slave trade, then that solves part of the problem. And it's rebellions like the one in Demerara in 1823 that take place in this interim period between the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and the abolition of slavery in 1834 that really catalyze the emancipation effort because they prove that 
abolishing the slave trade is not going to be enough. That's not going to produce this gradual amelioration. Because that was the other thing is abolitionists in the UK, those who are pushing for the abolition of the slave trade on moral grounds, thought it might be sufficient because once you cut off that infinite supply of labour, it will encourage planters to treat their enslaved people better because they won't be able to just work them to death and then get new ones. Again, proved to not really be the case. Slavery continued to be brutal. People continued to resist it. And so that changed the calculus and changed the sense that you had to abolish the institution itself if you wanted to keep control of the colonies and not have them go the way of Haiti. So the rebellion in Demerara is part of that series of uprisings in this intervening period and was as so many of the rebellions at the time were, you had a similar one in Barbados, you had a similar one in Jamaica, about this sense of Britain has freed us and there is an effort on behalf of planters to suppress that freedom. So you often have this at the time where it's fascinating because it often involves enslaved people expressing allegiance to the king or queen of Britain and a sense that the British people are on their side, this distant benevolent ruler, but it's the planters in the country itself that are the cause of their suffering. So yes, in 1823, it was an uprising of slaves. It started off with an idea that they would just go on strike and it it spiralled from there. And it was around this idea that their freedom was being illegitimately kept from them. And so they had to seize it by force. And unfortunately, a lot of them were massacred by the militia. And then there were these very brutal almost show trials of many of the conspirators where a lot of them were put to death. And so it did end in failure in one sense, but because it was part of this relentless push to force the British hand, essentially, I think all of these are examples of success in the long run because they all formed part of the the story and the reason why you ended up having slavery abolished in 1834. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask a kind of lot less important question, I think, but still I would be interested to find out. You have a couple of mentions about the search for the city of gold in Demerara. Mm. Could you tell us about that if it's at all important? So the reason it featured, I think, is twofold. So partly the the search for El Dorado just across Latin America was such a core part of colonialism in that era that it felt important to touch on in a book that's considering the effects of colonialism more broadly. And I think in particular, that idea of the image of someone going down this incredibly beautiful natural landscape, but being completely unmoved by any of it, because all they're searching for is this perfect symbol of European greed, a city of gold, was so evocative to me. And obviously, Rachel is undergoing her own quest narrative. So it made sense to allude to other historical quests in the region. But the second more mundane reason is that I, in the course of doing research for the book, read a few non-fiction books dealing with the histories of the specific islands because I wanted the book to reflect the Caribbean in its diversity. You know, the region, the, the different countries of the Caribbean are not the same, although they have some features in common. So I read histories of Barbados and I read histories of Trinidad and I read histories of Guyana. And it was actually a fascinating book that combined the history of Trinidad with actually the history of Venezuela. And it's by V.S. Naipaul. And it's about the search for El Dorado across a few different generations and how Trinidad was often used as a base for the groups that would then go out and try and find the city of gold. That was fresh in my mind because of this book that I'd read in searching for information about Trinidad. I decided to sort of sprinkle a reference in, in the novel as well. I don't know. Makes sense. It was interesting to see. So go on then. We will we will stop on this topic. What's next? Yes, I am working on a novel set in Nova Scotia. It's a love story. The inspiration was that there were two communities of formerly enslaved people that ended up in Nova Scotia. One was the Black Loyalists who'd fought for the British in the American War of Independence. And then their freedom was obviously under threat when the British were withdrawing. And so the British said, well, if you go to Nova Scotia, we can guarantee your freedom there. And then you have the Jamaica Maroons, these communities of runaways who were in many ways part of and colluding with the plantation system, rebel in the 1870s and get deported to Nova Scotia as punishment. So the book is a love story about two women from these very different backgrounds and again covering the ground of what it means to be free and these different visions of freedom these different experiences that can lead people to very different conclusions about what freedom is but also very basically Jamaica is such a different place (laughs) to Nova Scotia Virginia is such a different place to Nova Scotia so when I thought about what it would have been like when I think about what it was like for my own grandparents coming to the UK from a warm place and having never seen fog before, you know, feeling absolutely freezing in winter. There's all these, I think, 
latent familial things that I'm working through as well about what it means to be kind of taken to a place that is so different from the place that you know and how to deal with the cold. Yeah, fascinated by cold places. So it's been wonderful to get to know and write about Nova Scotia. Do you have a Windrush novel in you? I do. I think I do. I think I do. I mean, The Shadow that Andrea Levy's Small Island cast is long because it's such a brilliant book and I kind of think such a perfect Windrush novel, what comes after it. But actually, one of the things I am interested in is telling a story through the generations. So the Windrush and then my mother's generation, my generation, I think there are patterns there that are probably common to quite a lot of immigrant communities where this journey that I've been on with River Sing Me Home, I think it's my generation, it's the generation that feels very comfortable and secure in our British identity that turn back to our Caribbean roots and see interest and joy in reconnecting with them in a way that the first and second generations in this country were told so often that their heritage didn't count, that their heritage wasn't important, that they find it harder to do. So I would love to write a story one day about those dynamics and about a few generations of a family and how they navigate that experience. That would be really interesting. A saga with a a real purpose then. So Eleanor, it has been an absolute joy having you today. I have really enjoyed reading your book. Uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I do hope you enjoyed this episode. Do join me next time. And The Wormhole Podcast, episode 78, was recorded on the 2nd of June and published on the 10th of July, 2023. Music and production by Charlie Place.